Good evening and welcome to another Youth Town Hall hosted by the Montgomery County Council. Tonight we're here at Wheaton High School in Silver Spring. All right. Our council members are eagerly awaiting to hear directly from students about the issues that matter to them. If you're watching from home, you can still participate by using our social media hashtags Moco Youth and My Voice Matters. We're on Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. Our handle is at Moco Council Maryland. Tonight's format is going to be a question and answer, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. I, along with my colleague Lillian Mass, who will be on that side of the room, will be fielding your questions. Please be patient as we do try to get to all the questions as time will allow. Well, without further ado, let me hand it over to our council president, Nancy Navarro, to kick off tonight's event. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Buenas noches. It is really a pleasure to be here with you at Wheaton High School. I uh, actually represent this area, District 4, and this particular school was one of my top priorities back in 2013, and I am so excited to be back here. Uh, really, truly, it is an amazing facility. Um, this year, we've held, hosted two town halls. We had one in Clarksburg, and then this one here in Wheaton, because we wanted to make sure that it would be geographically accessible to all residents of the county. It is really an amazing opportunity to hear from you. Uh, I want to remind you, of course, that uh, the county council is the body that is in charge of passing all the laws. We are in charge of also adopting the final budget for all government services, and we make all the land use decisions. While we do not uh, make policy for the school system, I know that in these town hall meetings, there's always a lot of questions about our schools and education, and so we'll do everything possible to answer those, but if not, we're taking notes and we'll make sure that our Board of Education can uh, answer those questions. Um, I will also say that our colleague Tom Hucker is right now at the East County Budget Forum that the County Executive is hosting, so he's not here this evening, but I know that Jill Orman Faust from his uh, office is here somewhere there she is, um, and uh, she'll be taking notes for him as well. Um, I also want to um, tell you that, as it was mentioned, this is a question answer. This is a dialogue. I'm going to ask my colleagues um, to keep the answers brief, and I will only turn to two at a time because we want to have enough time to hear from you. And I think it's only fair that we spend most of the time hearing about what are your questions, et cetera. I know that we have interpretation uh, services as well. Para aquellas personas que necesitan servicio de interpretación, tenemos, yo sé, equipo. Así que también pueden hablar con Lilian Mas para recibir ese tipo de apoyo. All right, so um, I forgot to say that I also chair the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee, uh, and I uh, serve on the Education and Culture Committee, and so um, it is really an amazing um, opportunity to hear from you. We're going to introduce ourselves. I'm going to start with my colleague, Gabe Albornoz, that is all the way to my right. Uh, good, good evening, everybody. My name is Gabe Albornoz, one of your four members, of uh, at-large members of the County Council. This is my first term in office, and I am chair of the Health and Human Services Committee, but also serve on the Public Safety Committee. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Look forward to your questions. Good evening. I'm Andrew Fritz, and I guess I'm the youth member of the uh, County <laughs> Council. I'm the closest one to have graduated from Montgomery County Public Schools, uh, but I represent Western Montgomery County, from the district line to the Frederick County line, all the way along the Potomac River, Bethesda, Chevy Chase, Potomac, North Bethesda, Kensington, all the way to Poolsville. I serve on the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee and the Planning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee and serve as the Council's lead for parks. Great to be here. Good evening, everyone. I'm Craig Rice, uh, Council Member representing District 2. I chair our Education and Culture Committee, uh, and I serve on our Health and Human Services Committee. My area starts with Montgomery Village and North Potomac and goes all the way up to the Frederick County line, which of course includes areas like Germantown, Clarksburg, Boyd's, Hyattstown, Damascus, Darnstown, et cetera, all of the up county, including a large portion of our agricultural reserve. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sidney Katz. I'm the vice president of the council. I represent District 3, which is Gaithersburg, Rockville, Washington Grove, and it goes all the way around to Leisure World. I'm on the Government Operations Committee, and I serve as the chair of the Public Safety Committee. 
Good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Will Jawando. I'm one of your four at-large members, which just means that I represent the whole county. Um, born and raised in Silver Spring, and I serve on the Education and Culture Committee uh, with the Council President and with uh, Chairman Rice. And I also serve on the Planning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee. Great to be with you all tonight. Good evening, everybody. I'm Evan Glass. I'm also one of your at-large members. There are four at-large members. I'm the third one that you're going to hear from. And as Councilmember Jawando said, that we represent the entire county, all 1.1 million people, all 500 square miles. And I serve on the Health and Human Services Committee and the Transportation and Environment Committee. And I'm also the Council's point person on issues related to homelessness and vulnerable communities. Hi hey everybody, I'm Hans Reamer, and I'm chair of the Planning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee, and I serve on the Transportation, Energy, Infrastructure, and Environment Committee. I'm one of the four at-large members of the council. I've been on the council, I'm in my ninth year, starting my third term. I've got a few pieces of legislation before the council that you might be interested in. One is a ban on flavor vaping uh, products deliver, being delivered to uh, retailers. Another is a policing advisory commission that's intended to promote community policing. So I'll look forward to talking about those issues and others tonight. Thanks for being here. All right, we can begin. All right, let's start with our first question here. Um, he, will be also, he will also be using an interpreter. Um, good night, my name is um, Daniel. I'm ninth grader, and my question is, how can, you how can the county support the students who have to work to support their families? How can the county help students that have to work to help their families financially? Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna turn it to Councilmember Rice, who is the chair of the Education Committee. So thank you very much for that question. And actually, there's a great uh, movement that's going on within our schools. Uh, and it started by this uh, group that was put together called the Kerwin Commission. And the Kerwin Commission was designed to revamp education in the state of Maryland and make it more effective for all students. One of the things that we realized is that many students uh, do have to work to support their families and are also looking for career pathways immediately once they leave school, um, understanding that if they went to college, that would continue to not allow them uh, to directly support their families. So what we're doing is we're actually allowing students, uh, if these current commission recommendations are approved by the General Assembly, to start the career pathways in 10th grade. Uh, so they would actually start getting certification. So if you wanted to go in a certain career pathway, let's say that you wanted to be a coder, uh, you would actually start getting coding certifications while in high school. And you could actually use those coding certifications in the workforce. And so that way what would happen is, instead of you being relegated to as a high school student not having a lot of experience and most likely having a minimum wage job, the reality is, is that you could actually get something that's actually a little bit more productive in terms of what the financial needs of that individual are. And so it's really providing more options to our students. And so you'll see that starting with our new uh, uh, curriculum uh, that's coming out of uh, Montgomery County Public Schools. So it's really exciting to see that. In addition, we have our Summer Rise program that's there designed to give internships. It's a real interesting summer experiences that give an opportunity for uh, people to start joining the workforce. We know that for kids right now, it's incredibly hard to find jobs. My daughter is a senior in high school, just got her first job and she's been applying every year. I can tell you right now, we understand and get it. It's tough out there because we have a lot of folks who used to uh, be able to work in a lot of our minimum wage jobs who are young people and those, are, th those jobs are already filled. And so we really need to do a better All job right. when it comes to economic development as well, but okay. I'll leave it there. All right, and uh, ¿tú hablas español? Lo otro que te quiero decir es que también tenemos un programa increíble en Edison y estamos tratando de promover muchas de esas carreras técnicas para que tengas la oportunidad también de graduarte con algún tipo de certificado donde puedas tener un buen trabajo porque sabemos que muchos de nuestros estudiantes tienen que ayudar a sus familias y estamos ofreciendo ese tipo de programas apoyando el sistema escolar para que lo hagan también en el área eh, del norte del, del condado eh, también transporte eh, ofreciendo también transporte público gratis para los estudiantes para que puedan quizás ir a sus trabajos después de la escuela entonces esas son algunas de las cosas que estamos haciendo también okay. next bueno. Okay. Yeah. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Kendi, este, Kendi García, este, tengo una pregunta, 
Mi pregunta es que queremos que cambien la comida porque solo pollo, pizza y hamburguesas dan. Necesitamos que cada semana den comida de cada cultura, diferentes comidas saludables. Gracias. Good evening. My name is, her name is um, uh, Kendi, and uh, she would like uh, for the school menu to be changed because the, all they get is po uh, chicken, pizza, and hamburgers. <laughs> and um, she's requesting that um, if, uh, please, you guys can give them nutritious meals that represents the diver their diversity and their culture. Turn to Councilmember Jawanda, who's a member of the Education Committee. Gracias. Thank you for the question. Um, so I just was at the facility where they produce all the food for Montgomery County schools. Um, and one of the questions that I brought up along with some of our state legislators who also are concerned about this is how do we not only change the variety, so the question you actually brought up, how do we get different types of food? I'll pause so you can get that on. So I was just at the place where all of the food is made for all of MCPS, and we were asking, how do you get different types of food that reflect our cultural diversity, but also uh, is healthy and is locally grown, which is important too, to make sure that they're, or we're supporting our local uh, farmers and people who have produce so it's not shipped from far away. So that's an issue that I care about, the state legislators care about, and so do your school board members. And that's certainly an issue that we will bring up. But if you have a specific menu item, you can go right to the school board, and that's a policy question that you can bring up with them as well. Okay. Thank you. All right, next question. Hi, my name is Nestor Fabritz Lugo. I go to A. Mario Lorderman Middle School. And one, one of my questions is, is there any way you can get more outdoor education implemented into seventh and eighth grade and sixth grade? Because when I went to the open house, I noticed that outdoor ed was only for sixth grade. All right, who would like to uh, comment on that? Um, I, one of the things that I wanna remind everybody is again, um, we are definitely gonna take all of these questions into consideration. We cannot tell the school, well, we can tell the school board that these things were put up, but we cannot make those changes because that is something that the school board has to do. Uh, at the previous town hall, we had the president of the board sitting with us, but unfortunately, uh, they do have a meeting tonight and she couldn't be here. Um, but these kinds of questions are ones that we're taking notes and we will relay to our uh, colleagues on the Board of Education to see if this is something that they can add. Uh, many times it's difficult because they do have specific days by law that they have to have instruction. And so sometimes it's difficult to incorporate other kinds of um, you know, initiatives like that, but I think it's a really good point. And Councilmember Fitzen does want to uh, talk to you because he's closer in age as you are, so you probably can. <laughs> well, I also just wanted to bring up, I think Outdoor Ed is a really terrific program that I participated in when I was in middle school. I think expanding that is a great idea, and I echo what the council president said. Uh, but we're also working really hard on the council to increase the number of outdoor recreational opportunities. Uh, there are public places, the council president led the effort and we just opened the new uh, uh, Wheaton Library, which has a park as a key component uh, of that, which is a terrific facility, but we're looking at uh, parks and open spaces and recreational opportunities that are outdoors because we understand how important they are to have places where you can go that are safe, that are healthy, uh, that can help you uh, meet friends in a place where you feel comfortable. And so we're continuing to work on that. We fought really hard during the budget to make sure that we funded it in a way that kept up with the needs and we'll continue to make sure that we're providing those opportunities for you and for your friends and for your families. At the risk of sounding a little bit like a parent, um, Check out scouting if you haven't. There, there are a He's lot a of programs. He is a scout. He is a scout. Oh, I couldn't see your uniform. <laughs> all right. Yes. You're in your scout you uniform. Go. See? That's all well, you're getting yes. all the outdoor education that you could possibly <laughs> take, I think. So have good, fun. Good suggestion. There you go. All right. I, hey, that was a pretty good suggestion. That was a pretty good suggestion. <laughs> and he took it right away. He, he did. Was scout. Amazing. Amazing. Very well. Just like that. That. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. Getting all results right. here. Next me. question. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Genesis Valle. I am a ninth grader and I attend Montgomery Blair High School. I feel very passionate about the issue I will speak about today because at my past middle school, I only hung out with foreigners and as a minority student, 
I would get picked on or I would get told racial slurs, I would get made fun of because of the fact that we were foreigners and, oh shoot. It's okay, you're doing great. And a minority student, mm -hmm. which is why my question is, what are you doing to provide safe spaces for foreigners and minority students who need mental and emotional support? Thank you so much for that question. Let me just very quickly say that I myself am, I am an immigrant. I am, uh, English is my second language. And so I know what it's like to be in a school where you don't even understand what's going on and you feel really left out. Um, so this is an area that is of great, great interest to this council. Uh, and it's something that we have worked really hard to make sure that our school system understands who we are. It is a school system that is majority student of color. It is a school system that has a very high proportion of students who do come from other countries. Um, so we have done quite a bit to ensure that the school system continues to take this into consideration and provides the necessary support so that you feel welcome and that you receive the kind of education that you, that you deserve. Um, let me turn over to Council Member Katz, who is the lead for mental health, and then Council Member Rice. Well, and thank you, Madam President, and thank you for that question. Let me say very clearly, and I'm the chair of the Public Safety Committee as well, let me say very clearly that bullying is never okay. I don't care. If, if what happened with you when you were having a little difficulty speaking and you did a great job, don't, don't think you had any difficulty, but when you thought you were having, someone came and stood next to you because they wanted you to know that you're not alone. And that's exactly what we need to do when someone is being bullied. We need to, for someone else to come over and stand with you. We need, in fact, she should get a round of applause yeah. for what she just did. Bullies are much more afraid than, than they are tough, I can tell you. And, and I also, and yes, and I also want to say that we have school resource officers. We have, we have a police officer here this evening with us. We have school resource officers. It, go to someone who's an adult in your school. Do not keep this a secret. Make certain that someone is aware of it and we will, we will certainly work on it. And I can also tell you that we're working on the mental health side as well, and I guess Council Member is Auburn, or, or Rice or someone else will comment on that one. Thank you. Just very quickly, I just wanted to let you know we added mental health counselors as a part of last year's budget, yeah. specifically because we heard at the last youth town hall last year, uh, and from Chloe Appel, who was your former uh, council member for a day about this issue. We also uh, added uh, more resources to our text, uh, text to chat line for mental health as well. So there are ways in which you can reach out via texting. You don't even have to talk to someone, um, but you can talk to them via text uh, and, and make sure that they understand. Let me just close by saying this. Bullying is illegal. Let me just be very clear with you. Bullying is illegal. How do I know? I wrote the law. In the state of Maryland, it is illegal to bully. So make sure that you let your, your administrators know. And if they're not doing what they need to in terms of protecting you, call our offices. Don't worry. We'll go down there and have a conversation with them. There you go. Yep. All right. Next. All right. Here's our next question. Okay. Um, hi, I am Jerusalem, and I go to John F. Kennedy High School. I attend to this program called Liver's Promise. It's a program that they help immigrants with their education and college and things like that. And so my question was, how can you guys help us with this kind of programs? Sure, so um, I know that everybody is really excited about Liberty's Promise. I, I can't help myself but just very quickly say that it is an amazing program. Uh, and the council has supported Liberty's Promise. I will also say that one of the graduates of Liberty's Promise is actually the National Latino Outreach Director for a current presidential candidate. 
And this is somebody from Kennedy High School, Jonathan J. Green, I'm just giving him a shout out, who started with Liberty's Promise, uh, and look where he is. So it is an extraordinary program. Uh, let me turn it over to Councilmember Albornoz, who chairs the HHS committee. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Jerusalem, thank you for that comment. I am also very familiar with Liberty's Promise and had the opportunity last school year to come and speak to a group of remarkable students at Northwest High School. And I hope to come out and speak to students at Liberty's Promise before. But just to connect the dots, um, what Genesis was talking about before, Liberty's Promise is exhibit A of the kind of program and supports that really make a difference in providing a safe space for our immigrant youth and to come together and talk about challenges that they're facing and talk about opportunities before them. And so this council and past councils have been extraordinarily supportive of programs like this. And I think you'll find that there will be a lot more support moving forward as well. Yes. Next. Hi, I am Shalom Ayivi. I'm a senior at Montgomery Blair High School. My question today is, um, how can schools inform students or up students in general, like upcoming freshmen, about um, career building programs like Edison and dual enrollment? I am currently in Edison, and I joined like for fun with my friend. And without that program, that program really helped me like to know what I want to do in the future. And my question is like, how can schools help inform other students so they can have the same opportunity I had? Okay, Councilmember Jawanda, and then Councilmember Rima. Thank you for the question, and I'm excited that you're at Edison. Um, what program are you in? Um, I am in Academy of Health Professions Year 2. All right. Nice. Awesome. Thanks. Awesome. Um, so the good news is, is that we all know this, as well as the school board, and there's a big focus within MCPS right now to rebrand what was traditionally called career and technical education mm -hmm. and expand it and to really realizing that all students need work-based learning opportunities and need the opportunity to know what type of programs like the one you're in, in the health field or IT or whether it's engineering or mechanical stuff. We, there's a ton of programs and it's not widely known. <laughs> and actually, though, you can, in some of them, you can do dual, dual enrollment and get college credit. So the school system is rebranding that and is trying to push that out more. We on the council are, are very supportive of those efforts. Uh, Councilmember Rice mentioned Summer Rise, which I had the honor of Create, uh, working on and helping to create about three years ago. That's a summer program for work-based learning opportunities. Um, we're also working on the Fed Committee, as I'm sure Councilmember Reamer will say, about how do we add uh, different opportunities in, uh, at our incubators and with our pipeline and career pipelines to give opportunities for young people. That's something I'm particularly passionate about. So it's going to be part of our whole economic development strategy. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, you'll be hearing more about that, but you can spread the gospel like you did tonight and keep telling your fellow students too, because right. the word of mouth is really important on that too. Yeah, you asked the right question. You know, how can we raise awareness among the students about the opportunities that exist? I think that's a real challenge that we need to do a better job with, starting with students at younger ages. And it's not only helping students understand the opportunities that exist in MCPS, like the academy programs, like the CTE programs, but it's also about career pathways and career opportunities in general. Um, you know, show of hands, how many of uh, the students here have ever had a presentation about, for example, jobs in the biotechnology sector in Montgomery County? Show of hands, like, sh hold them high if you could so I can see, because I can't see too well. So I see a few, you know, I see a few hands. Um, but, you know, I would love for that to be everyone. I mean, you know, everyone should know that there are thousands of jobs in this region and that they are available to kids who are PhDs, but also not. You can just have a two-year technical degree and there's employment opportunities. Mm -hmm. So it really is at every level. And I, we need to get to the point where everyone knows what those opportunities are. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our next question. Um, I'm. I'm Jack McAuliffe. I go to Wheaton High School. Um, <laughs> my question is, uh, it's about um, school start times and how they relate to uh, sleep deprivation. Um, sleep deprivation is a chronic problem among high school students, and chronic sleep deprivation is detrimental to adolescent brain development. A recent literature review of 38 reports found that later school start times reduced tardies and absences, improved overall uh, 
grades of students in um, the main classes being math, uh, English, science, and history. Uh, it reduced rates of depression and anxiety, and it, uh, in it decreased the number of auto accidents teens were involved in. Um, based on this, and evidence like it, California passed a law uh, making all schools start at 8.30 or later. As one of the country's best school systems, why aren't we making decisions based on the evidence? Thank you for that question. I know that the school board has taken this issue up. It had made some changes. Um, I think you're referring, which is a good question, perhaps the state needs to start working on this issue. Uh, and it's something, obviously, that you know, we could relate to the school board and also talk to them about. Of course, there are a lot of logistics that go into it, but I think that the evidence is very clear and we should not just stop because of logistical issues. Um, Councilmember Rice, anything you'd like to add? Sure, I, I, I just wanna say that um, there are a lot of complicated issues that go along with this because we have three tiers of our school system. We have our high school students, we have our middle school students and elementary school, school students. And so what happens is the later we start our high school times, uh, the later we then start middle and elementary school. And part of the concern is, is that we don't want our elementary school children, some of who are walking, like we see what is happening uh, when we have daylight savings time to be walking late in the evening as well. So there are safety challenges that are also involved in this. It's logistical. It's not something that prohibits us from addressing this from the issues that you're talking about. It is the reason why the school board did make the decision that it did and actually shifted the time later. Uh, you know, but um, there's still a lot of conversation around how the school board can do a little bit more around this. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that it's incredibly expensive as well. If we were to truly do it to where we started all of our schools at the same time, we'd actually have to grow the number of buses that we have because we use the same buses for high school, middle, and elementary school students, and we'd have to find a place to store them, yeah. which is one of the biggest challenges that we face. So again, not to say that anything that you said isn't true and valid, but there are a lot of other pieces to the puzzle, which is why it's not just as simple as saying, Let's just go forward and move with this. And so I, I want you to contact my office. Um, I'd love to talk with you about this and link you up with our school board and our school board member, Nate Tenbite, uh, who can work with you on some of this and continue to advocate for ways in which we may be able to enact some changes. There are actually some unique things around scheduling of classes for high school students that actually make it easier if you had homeroom first and had a chance to warm up your brain and relax for a bit before you actually start in some of the classes, and some people have done some of those things. So um, right. please get with me afterwards. Thank you. Hello, my name is Imran Kanyuni. I go to Montgomery Blair High School. I'm a senior there, and I'm here with the YAC program at the Montgomery County Recreations Department. Um, my question has to do with um, better training for faculty members and staff because I noticed at my school that some boys who may have experienced sexual assault won't know what it is or like how to report it because they're afraid of like jock culture, like afraid that they'll be persecuted because they report this and that there's some programs that at, around the county like Choose Respect that like help people come forward about it but it's not really advocated for and not many people know about it. So I wanted to know how could you train faculty members and staff to point out warning signs and specifically males who sometimes could be too afraid to come forward about mm -hmm. their sexual harassment cases mm -hmm. and advertising the programs you have in place in Montgomery County. Wow, thank you for that question. Council Member Albernos. Great question and thank you for being part of YAC, our Youth Advisory Committee, um, and I want to just acknowledge publicly how awesome the county's recreation department is. I used to work for the recreation department for 12 years. I was the director. The, the former director was just amazing. Yes. Um, so I, I think this is a significant issue. One of the issues that we're trying to tackle right now in the council is our school health nurse program. So our school nurses are actually employees of our county's health and human services department. It's a unique model. And what we learned recently was that 
confirmed what we suspected was true is that there are not nearly enough school health nurses to really meet the needs and the demands of our student population. And that is such a critical component. And our school health nurses do more than just provide day-to-day -day medical care. They are often the first line of defense when it comes to mental health issues. They often have to make referrals. And uh, we as a council are committed to and are, uh, have actually sent a letter over to the county executive requesting more funding be placed in the budget so we can enhance more staff support. And as you heard earlier from my colleague, Councilmember Rice, we are also working aggressively to add more counselors within schools as well. But even beyond that, I think there is training for all staff at all levels that needs to take place uh, because you never know whom a student will be comfortable reaching out to. And we have to make sure that whomever that person is, they're prepared to deal with and process that information in a way that's productive and helpful. Great question and agree completely that we need more work here. And be assured that we're gonna keep that in mind as we also hold our own um, uh, hearings for the budget and as we do our own work through our budget, this is very important testimony because it is something we've been pushing and it validates our concern as well. Okay, Council Member Fietzen. Yeah, I, we've had a couple of great questions from some Blair Blazers, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that I'm sitting next to a newly minted member of the Blair High School Hall of Fame, Craig Rice. So <laughs> I, I know, we're really lucky out. here. <laughs> and I have a feeling I'm, we might be sitting among some future <laughs> Blair High School Hall well, of Fame. Of course. Absolutely. All right, next question. Um, hi, I'm Ava, and this is Abby. And this is Abby, and we're juniors at Montgomery Blair High School. And we are activists with the Sunrise Movement, which is a group of youth-led activists who are working to fight climate change and create millions of good jobs in the process. Um, we've been working on a resolution in Montgomery County to endorse the Federal Green New Deal. This resolution would mean that Montgomery County would encourage the federal government to pass the Green New Deal and that it would implement Green New Deal-like policies on a local level. It would be a really amazing chance for the county to lead the nation in showing what it looks like to fight the climate crisis in a just and equitable way. So I'm hoping to hear from all of the council members on whether you would be willing to support this resolution. Okay, let me turn over to Council Member Glass and then Council Member Reamer. Ava and Abby, Ava and Abby it's good to see you again. Uh, I enjoyed our conversation when you came to the council. And let me just ask everybody here, who has been to the council before? To meet with us, to attend a meeting? Okay, I don't see really any hands. I see a few, a few. Uh, a few. and a few. parents, of course. Thank you, parents. But please plan over the next year or so, or if you're only a, a freshman or sophomore, please plan sometime in the future to come visit us and meet with us so you can advocate just like Ava and Abby have to me and I know to many of our colleagues. Uh, I serve on the Environment Committee, as I said earlier, and uh, we are making sure that Montgomery County is a leader in fighting climate change, right? Because we know that you all deserve a bright future, and that that won't happen if the Earth is in a terrible shape. And so while there are policies that, I'll say the current president, you know, uh, is dismantling uh, at the national level or at the international level, we're doing a lot here right now. We are working on making sure that our bus fleet is electric, and I know that my colleague, uh, Councilmember Remo, will probably talk about that, but we're also doing a lot more with composting and recycling and making sure that our buildings are energy efficient. <laughs> you know, when we talk about energy efficiency here, about 50% of our energy is used on transportation, and about 50% are on buildings. So it's complex from our perspective, but we're working through it to make sure that we are as green as possible. And I think we're doing a good job, but we can always do better. And so, uh, and to Ava and Abby, I don't know where you went, you're over there. As I told you in the meeting, I support your initiative. Okay, go Thank you for the question. I appreciate your activism. Uh, uh, first of all, I, although I'm very uh, distressed about the state of the environment and the pace of climate change, I do feel like we are starting to really bring a critical mass of pressure and awareness and energy and concern to bear. And, and I feel we're on the verge of breaking through and making bigger changes. And I think the activism of young people is really a huge part of that. So 
keep it up and grow and grow and grow the circle. Um, my reaction to the idea of passing a resolution is, I, don't, I think what you really want us to do or what you should really be demanding that we do is actually take action rather than passing a resolution which says that action should be taken and, but we don't know quite what. You should be demanding that we take specific actions that will actually move the needle. So for example, smart growth. What are we doing to put housing near public transportation so that people don't drive as much and create as much pollution? You could be demanding that the county council support more housing near the purple line, near Metro, um, and I think you would get a lot of support for that. What about solar power? What are we doing to generate clean, renewable energy so we don't rely as much on coal-fired or natural gas-fired power plants? There are very specific measures that we could take to what more make solar uh, a bigger part of our local energy production, whether that's solar panels on the roofs of schools or other government buildings or solar panels in the farmland parts of the community where land is cheap and it is really affordable to deploy. So there's a lot of changes that we need to take. I don't think we have time for resolutions. I think we need to go to action. So that's my challenge back to you. Focus us on a couple of actions and demand that we make progress on them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next question. All right, what's the next question? Over here. Okay, uh, my name is Luke Karen. I'm a student climate activist with Fridays for Future and a junior at Northwood High School. So, as a cyclist, I bike to school every day because it is much healthier for the environment than riding a car. In thanks for my actions, most days I ride to school breathing in everybody else's exhaust and often the exhaust from county utility vehicles and school buses that sometimes leave me choking for multiple seconds after they pass me on the road. Furthermore, mirroring this antidote, Montgomery County is in the 90th percentile of all counties and cities across the US in terms of air pollution. Given this, what is the county currently doing to tackle the problem of air pollution and specifically that. And given my antidote and your personal opinion, what do you believe can be done better and do you think you can be doing better? Okay, I'll start us off. Great, great question. You know, the, the local air pollution, a lot of it is from vehicles. You know, regional air pollution, a lot of it is from power plants. Um, so we can, we can do things to affect both of those. We are, the county government operations are 100% carbon neutral, so all the power that we buy to run county buildings, not school buildings, are uh, from clean, renewable energy. Um, but locally, we need to do a lot more to promote alternative modes of transportation. I think we're making some progress. It's an amazing to see the investment in Metro, you know, the purple line that's coming in. Um, but at the same time, we've, we've got to do a lot more uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure so that that can become ubiquitous, more bus service. Uh, we did expand the bus service a bit this year with the Kids Ride Free program, but on the other hand, we actually had to cut a few bus lines because we just didn't have resources to offset the cuts that the county executive had proposed. The bike infrastructure is a big piece of this. If you look in D.C., the amount of biking that is now part of the transportation network is like 500 times what it was 10 years ago. And a lot of that is just, it's a, it's a cultural change, but it's also because of infrastructure. So if you are in downtown Silver Spring right now, you'll see a protected bike lane loop that we're trying to complete. And we have that idea in the works for Bethesda and Wheaton um, and White Flint. But we need to bring that to every urban area in the county um, to, so that biking can really be a safe alternative for more people. Thank you. Councilmember Rice had some additional thoughts. So you had asked a question about our fleet as well, and so just wanted to let you know that just this past September, at the end of September, uh, we actually received a grant of $1.75 million from the Federal Transit Administration uh, that we applied for through our Department of Transportation to actually change over our fleet of ride-on vehicles mm -hmm. from uh, the ones they are now, the hybrid, because they're not actual 
full to actual electric uh, buses. We've also done the same thing. We've also got a state grant uh, from the state when it comes to our school buses. And so we're looking at transitioning our school bus fleet uh, to electric as well. So the process is happening. We continue to apply for grants because they're incredibly expensive. Uh, and we need to have all of the charging stations, et cetera, that are necessary, but it's happening. And so we are working on that. Thank you. Yes, next question. Um, hi, I'm, my name is Stephanie Frank. I'm in seventh grade and I'm homeschooled. So my question is, how come homeschoolers are not allowed to participate in extracurricular activities at public schools when other states allow them to? Well, it's a state issue, and so it's a state law. And uh, every year there are some, there's some conversation about how could that be facilitated. Um, but really this is something that our state delegation and, and, and the entire state legislature has to address. Um, it is not something that we as council members can change. But we have had conversations about how could we um, allow some either homeschooling or even private schools um, to utilize some of those kinds of you know, public, public school amenities. Um, so it's something that will continue to be discussed, but it's not something that the county council can change. Okay. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Cristina Lara. Este, mi pregunta, yo represento Sligo Menesco. Uh -huh. Mi pregunta es que qué programas tienen para que nosotros podamos aprender más rápido el inglés ya que con nosotros se queda una maestra después de la escuela repitiendo lo que los dieron durante todo el día, la clase, y nosotros necesitamos un programa o que mejoren las clases de ISOL para que nosotros podamos aprender mucho más rápido el inglés. Good evening, my name is Rosa Lara, and I would like to ask you uh, what programs do you have so we can learn English uh, faster? Uh, they have, um, we have a teacher that stays late every day trying to teach us all the things that we were um, learning in school during the day. And uh, so we would like to know how can you improve the current programs, ESO, ESO classes, so they can learn faster. Okay, um, thank you. So. Um Nosotros estamos haciendo todo lo posible. Nosotros estamos haciendo todo lo posible para añadir recursos al sistema escolar para que puedan ofrecerle mejores clases de inglés y también programas. Eh, y entonces eso es algo que estamos repitiendo. Pero tenemos un número muy alto de estudiantes que están recibiendo clases de inglés. Y yo sé que todos los años eh, la Junta de Educación está viendo cómo añadir personal para que pueda entonces ofrecer mucho más apoyo. And so every year we do have this conversation with our school board about how can they strengthen our ESOL program to provide um, you know, better opportunities and enhanced opportunities for students to not just be tracked into ESOL, but to be able to acquire English proficiency so they can move forward with uh, their education. So we are going to continue to, to work with our school board to see what other kinds of um, programs there are. For example, they have dual language schools now that has been really uh, useful because then students can learn English faster, but then students who are English speaker can, for example, learn Spanish and then be bilingual, which is an amazing asset to have. So there are some innovative things that we're exploring to, um, to assist those students who, um, who are you know, not English speakers. Yes. Just really quickly, I also just wanted to let you know that the current commission recommendations call for additional funding from the state to beef up our English language learner programs within all of our schools in the state of Maryland. So please encourage folks to support the current commission recommendations that will do just what you're asking and provide money from the state to help. Thank you. Okay, next. Hi, my name is Izzy. Um, I'm in sixth grade and, and I go to Benjamin Vanneker Middle School. My question is um, why are Based on our gender, why are we getting like separated from different activities? Like, especially if you're trans, like, what if um, you want to join a, a boys program and like a girl wants to join a boys program and a boy wants to join a girls program? Why, like, can we not do that? 
That is a great question uh, that I think we will relate to our members of the school board. Um, I know that there has been a lot of awareness and also education around how can we make sure that all of our students are accommodated and can participate and also uh, can be incorporated and included in all kinds of uh, activities and, uh, and ensure that you know, regardless of how you identify, that you see yourself in, you know, included. So this is a very interesting uh, point that you bring up and I think that it's something that we can definitely have a discussion with the school board to see if they can look at their policies and see how they can be a bit more integrated. Yes, Councilman Marimer. Uh, I, I just wanted to say, um, I'm so glad that Scouts has finally opened up so that girls and boys can serve together. Um, I think that is a fantastic step forward, yep. and I am so thrilled to see uh, that there are some girls who are here in Scouting. Uh, my, my, I, I, would, I really share your sentiment. I think that kids ought to be able to participate in the program as they identify, and I don't know if that is what is allowed in MCPS, um, but that, that's something we should yeah. look into. Thank you. Yes. Hello, my name is Chloe Kuntz, and I am a sixth grader at Saigo Middle School. I do, um, I participate in Reg, Reg Extra pro Program. Um, my question is, why do teachers yell at kids and ki get kicked out of class? Um, Um, yeah, okay. And I would like um, um, teachers to cool down so they wouldn't get so mad. Thank you for that question. Um, teachers should not be yelling at students and, you know, kicking them out of class. Um, and so, Again, um, specifically, you know, to your school, we can also talk to you about a specific situation because sometimes it's good to know um, what's occurring in a particular school, a particular incident, so that, so that we can, you know, address it with the principal as well as with the teacher. Um, but just know that that is not something that should be, that is acceptable and, um, and that should be permitted. Councilmember Jawando. And thank you for being courageous enough to ask that question. I know it's a difficult question to ask in a school setting. Mm -hmm. um, as council president said, if that's happening, you know, talk, you need to tell your parents or your a caring adult or a counselor or somebody at the school uh, for specifically, and that's for any student. Uh, but I can tell you as a member of the education committee, as a parent of students myself, we are all, and I think I speak for all my colleagues, we all are very concerned if that's happening. We want teachers to be, and, and uh, administrators to be supportive of you. Uh, to help you achieve your dreams and your goals. And that is what the school board, and I'm sure the superintendent would say as well. And so uh, we actually are trying to allocate more resources in, in the areas uh, in training, and I know the school system has as well, for teachers to understand restorative justice and how to uh, be more holistic with their students and understand, and you have some schools uh, having a, a meditation and other techniques. So we're really, that's really a focus of the system. So if that's happening, you know, you can contact our office, you can contact the school board, but tell a caring adult. So, but thank you for asking that question. Hi, my name is Victor. I am a junior at Albert Einstein High School. Um, my question is about transportation. Much of our suburbs outside of cities are 50s and 60s buildings. They're, the car infrastructure is built to support, is built to support dual, um, single income families there. That was the case in the 50s where usually the man of the house would come out. Now thanks to a lot of progress happening, both men and women are in the workplace. However, that is causing the effect of traffic jams because of now dual income houses. In my neighborhood, there is a high amount of accessory apartments, a lot of which are not authorized and not up to code, which is a health and safety hazard. But my main question is about Vision Zero. Vision Zero is trying to reduce car lanes and reduce car capacity for people who are trying to get to work. Now, I would love to ride bikes. I need to learn how to ride a bike. Oh, I never said that. Um, <laughs> dang it. Um, 
but... I think you did, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so... I wouldn't want to ride a bike during a storm. I wouldn't want to ride a bike, you know, during, say, when it's, like, really cold outside. And I wouldn't want to stand on the bus stop. I would drive myself to work. Um, may I ask, where is the logic in be... Where is the logic in behind of... Where is the logic behind getting... Reducing car capacity with streets that are already way over capacity in cars. Okay, so um, so obviously this is a we could be here like all week talking about this topic. Right. I'm going to give you a very quick answer, and then I'll turn to my colleagues. Um, it's a balancing act. You know, you heard students talk about environmental issues. Uh, we have also discussed the fact that we have policies where we want to build more around metro stations because we want people to be able to be right next to and have access to transit. Uh, we are trying to make sure that we reduce speeds because that leads to pedestrian, more pedestrian incidents and fatalities. And so the reality is that we're trying to manage the fact that the county has really grown. And like you said, it's no longer necessarily just the suburbs of quiet single family homes. We have urban centers, you know, developing. We have neighborhoods that now are becoming more and more urban, and we have residents saying, we, we, know, we like to have more walking and mixed use. So it's a balancing act for a county of 500 you know, square miles and 1.1 million residents, where we're trying to be as responsive as we can by, through planning to address a changing county that will continue to change, and really at the same time, satisfy all of those needs. Um, so, so that's what we're doing, what we're trying to do as much as possible, especially through planning and through many of our committees that are looking at transportation and are looking at where do we put you know, single family homes or multifamily buildings and things of that nature. Um, so you know, it's not a one size fits all, but we do have to have some parameters and some policies because if, if we just leave it to chance, it will be totally unsustainable. Councilor McCann. Yeah, thank you for that question. You know, just yesterday, the uh, council president had a uh, press conference, and all of us, att all of us attended, um, um, that, that could be there, that talked about exactly what you're saying, how we have to have, for economic development, we need transportation, we need housing, we need jobs, we need uh, to make certain that people can get there safely. And so this is a, a puzzle that needs to fit together, and that's what we're attempting to do. It's not something that happens overnight. We didn't get to this problem overnight. We're not going to get it out of it overnight, but we're going to work on it to make certain that we can have a better situation. The, the, um, the, in many places, we started having town centers. We've had them throughout Montgomery County where people can work and live right where they, uh, and, and walk to, their, to a grocery store or to some other retail establishments. We're doing that as best we can. And you're right, there are two, house, two people in a household that are now going to work. In some cases, somebody can tele, a telecommute. In some cases, uh, some people can ride together and there's ride sharing. There's people that are looking at monorail. There's people that are looking at a variety of ways to correct the issues that we have today, but we need to work together to, to solve it. Councilman yes, Glass. Uh, real quickly, Victor, thank you for for sharing with us all the ways that you're trying to get around our community in a safe way. And we want you to be safe and we want everybody to be safe. And unfortunately, the reality is that we're not as safe as we need to be. You know, it's October, uh, uh, actually it's November um, of 2000. Like, <laughs> Time flies, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is November yeah. of 2019 and in wow. this year, in the last 11 months, there have been more than 400 incidents on our roads where pedestrians and bicyclists and motorists, um, everybody has been uh, affected by unsafe road conditions. And next week, we will be having a hearing at the council next Tuesday afternoon, talking about our plans, a 42 point plan to make our roadways safe. And it's that plan that's called Vision Zero, which Victor mentioned. And I encourage all of you, after Tuesday afternoon, check out YouTube, and that hearing will be on there so that you can see and, and hear all the information that we're doing to make our roads even safer. Okay, very um, quickly. Very quickly. You know, the, the, the amount of traffic on our roads is not from people walking and biking. It's from more and more people driving. And that trend is totally unsustainable. But if you go to downtown Wheaton right now, you'll see a terrific example of shifting priorities just a bit, having a real positive benefit. 
There are now cars parking on Georgia Avenue, right on the side of the road in the urban district, which we didn't used to have, and the speed limit is 25 now. It used to be higher. The, the, the benefit of cars parking in that travel lane is that everybody going through downtown Wheaton has to slow down just a little bit. It doesn't take you five more minutes to get through downtown Wheaton. It might take you an extra 20 seconds, but the, you are now driving in a manner, hopefully, that is more calm, where everyone around you feels a little bit safer, where pedestrians are less likely to get killed, where people hopefully feel safer to venture out on a bike. And you're not paying a real price as a driver either. It's fine. Mm -hmm. So if we do it right, I think it's a win-win for everybody. All right. Next question. Hello, my name is Simone Keenan, and I'm an eighth grader at Eastern Middle School. Um, over the three years I've been at Eastern Middle School, I've grown increasingly concerned about the state of the infrastructure at the place. Um, for example, la just last week we had two bathrooms that had a um, sewage backup. And we also, um, up until about a month ago, we didn't have a ceiling in the girls' bathroom in our cafeteria. And um, then I look around these sort of schools that have been renovated, and I'm wondering, um, how do you decide which schools get renovations and um, rebuilds? And how are you working to make sure that every school with different sorts of people get um, equal access to materials? Uh, so first I want to acknowledge that Delegate Emily Shetty is here from District 18. Um, and um, we don't make those decisions, um, but we do have to look at the budget. Uh, and we have to make sure that we uh, do everything possible to prioritize school construction because we understand that buildings really do need, you know, that assistance. This school used to obviously not look like this. It was, it was, it was in really bad shape, right? Um, but one thing I will say as chair of the committee that deals with finances is that we do have a challenge with what's called our debt service, meaning that we have done so much in construction and we've had, had to borrow that our, our debt is, is growing. And so that is why when Council Member Rice talks about the Kerwin Commission, which is what's happening at the state, we are really advocating so that the state could give us resources for school construction because it's not fair that the county has to do all of that and carry all of that knowing, like you just described, the needs that are out there. My daughters went to Rock Creek Forest Elementary School before it was renovated and everything that you're describing are things that they had experienced. Um, but it is tough. It is very tough because we know that the needs are greater than the funds that we have, but we're doing everything possible to respond to that. Um, so, you know, thank you for, for, for sharing that. I just want to, I'll, I will you defer to everybody else from the next one, just because yeah. there's yeah, a line. A lot, Go ahead. Long line. Okay. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Angel Johnson. Can you I speak a little Blair. bit closer to your mic so you can hear your beautiful Good voice? Good evening. My name is Angel Johnson. I attend Blair High School, and I'm in the YAC program. Today, my topic will be about racial profiling. Um, throughout the years that I've been in school, middle school, elementary, and high school, um, I've experienced racial profiling. I've been called racial slurs based off of the color of my skin, based off of something that I can't control. Um, one example of racial profiling that I've experienced is walking into your AP class and the teacher stops and asks you, do you have the right class? I can help you find your right class. Being the only student of color in that class, they automatically basically tag you as, oh, you're not in this class. So um, my question today for you guys is how can you decline the percentage of racial profiling in schools? Yeah. Thank, you for that, that, thank you for that very powerful question. Councilmember Jawando. Thank you for the uh, question. I'm sorry you had to ask it. Uh, I've heard this time and time again. Uh, it's the reason at schools like at Blair that they formed Black CAP, for example, and minority scholars programs. A lot of the students have talked about this. Um, we, we need and we expect all of our school professionals and everyone that is interacting with you and, our, and the rest of the students to think that every student and believe that every student can achieve to their highest potential, regardless of race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, religion, anything. And we know that that's not always happen, happening. We know that there are disparate expectations. I would encourage you to, uh, if you haven't already, to join and be a part of the Black and Brown Coalition mm -hmm. that has formed uh, for equity in our schools. And that's a group of uh, Black and Latino 
organizations and students and parents that are advocating on issues like this, like why are certain students getting put in certain math levels? Why are certain students being put on certain tracks that happens in elementary school? Um, and so we are all very aware, we were all at this big forum that was at Gaithersburg High School a few weeks ago where that was a main issue. Um, you should raise it with the school board as well um, and in your school building. And if that happens, you should report it immediately because it's unacceptable for anyone to not have high expectations mm -hmm. for students. And so we're here to support you in that. Uh, racial profiling is a national issue. It's an issue in every space that we're in. Uh, the council president has been leading us towards a racial equity and justice act that's going to actually be in committee tomorrow and I'll let her speak about that. But we're aware about the, of this issue in policing and housing and health and every issue uh, area and we're going to be working on it. So thank you for raising it. It's an important issue. I will only add that uh, as Councilmember Jawanda said we are about, we're poised to pass a law so that county government has to produce what's called a racial equity impact and social justice impact note for every legislation that we approve uh, and also for every budgetary decision that we make because we need to start addressing this from a structural level. Um, let me share with you that you know my daughters are Afro Latinas and my oldest daughter when she was in high school wrote this amazing essay about Malcolm X and uh, it was an AP course and the teacher accused her of plagiarism now I knew that wasn't true because we had worked on it together and she had shared it with me and I had to go have that difficult conversation with the teacher because she was the only black kid in that AP class. And so it is something that does happen and what you shared, we hear it all the time. Uh, the good news is that the school board is, is also very aware. And let me just close by saying, we know that the majority of the, school, of the students in our school system are students of color. We've talked about economic development and workforce, the workforce that we need we need all students to do very well and to know that they are respected and that they can really realize their potential because we need you guys as part of this workforce that is going to be the engine for this economic development that we need in our county. So this issue of you know, microaggressions and all this kind of thing needs to, just needs to stop. And the school system knows that. And so they're working also on cultural competency and our staff development because they're working on diversifying the teachers uh, and, you know, and, and, and everybody because that is essential to uh, the success of, of all of us uh, if we want our students to be able to realize, as I said before, you know, their potential. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, but do know that it's not as if it's an isolated story and that really is unacceptable. Thank you. Hi, my name is Matthew. I'm in seventh grade. I attend Julius West Middle School. And my question is, well, I wanna, it has a little bit of a explaining for you to understand. Um, my school has this thing. It's called No Place for Hate. And um, it's like this uh, program that where every student in the school has to sign a pledge that says they won't commit hate crimes against other students inside or outside of school. Mm -hmm. That it also applies to teachers, of course. Um, and my question is, um, how can um, rules like, how can you guys um, enforce the 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 rules of this program because it's not being followed a lot of the time. I've observed. Mm. All right, Councilmember Rice. So let me just say this: <clears throat> we wish that everyone would be good all the time. Um, that's our ultimate goal, and we know that we see this in our community and our society where people aren't good to each other all of the time. And it's a tremendous challenge for us because all you have to do, <clears throat> excuse me, is couple a person who's having a bad day with a person who decides that they're not gonna be good to them. And you have this culmination of a tremendous problem that could have been avoided. Um, there are a number of programs that we have throughout the county uh, that deal uh, when it comes to, and we deal with this with health and human services that deal with uh, conflict resolution. There are a number of conflict resolution programs that are uh, in some of our schools as well. But it's one of the things that uh, the Be Well 360 campaign that MCPS has just started to embark on 
is going to address. It's going to tackle that issue to make sure that people understand the impacts. When we had the person, the young lady who was talking about being bullied before, a lot of people don't know the impact of them being insensitive, of them being uh, the way they are and what that means to that person. They need to hear and understand the hurt that's there. I will tell you as a young person who came up in high school who had kids call me names, it still sticks with me. I still hear the name and I cringe when I hear it. And it's something that kids still call other kids today. These are the kinds of things that again, we won't be able to eliminate unless people understand what it does to people and how it impacts them and how it hurts them. And so that Be Well 360 campaign is educating people about that. So our school system is working on that very issue to make sure that health and wellness is not just about on the outside, but on the inside as well. So thank you for that. Thank you. Maria, when vengo a, mi pregunta es sobre el bullying, que necesita parar, porque es, el bullying es entre sí mismo, entre cada estudiante siendo de la misma raza, se miran mal, o sea, me explicó a que no tiene sentido, porque somos de lo mismo, son nacidos aquí y sus padres de otros, de otros lados. Y el estado, el bullying tiene que parar porque yo, uno, cuando uno lo trata mal, se siente feo, como que si lo estuviesen haciendo a un lado. Y también se siente feo porque uno habla con una persona y esa persona no hace nada. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Maria. I, my question is in regards to bullying. Bullying really has to stop because it, kids, even when they, they, are, they have the same race, they even disapprove each other. And teachers don't, don't do anything about it. And, and that's not really nice. So that doesn't make any sense because we all were born here. We come from the same place. And even though we might have parents that were born in other parts uh, of the of the country in another state that that it's not really nice. Um, well, let me turn well, to Councilor As we yes. as we've said time and time again this evening, and and we've said over and over again, bullying is not allowed. It's against the law, and we will not stand for it. And if someone, if you report it, when you report it, if someone does something to you, you need to tell an adult. You need to report it. And if something is not done at that point, then you need to call us or to call other, the uh, Board of Education. If it actually is um, something that the police need to be directly involved in, we need to, you need to contact them. We will not stand for it. And I can also tell you that bullying is not only in schools. We, we get bullied as well. And it, it doesn't work for us. I mean, someone that tries to bully us, we stand together and, and, uh, and we do not take it. And that's exactly what you need to do. We need to work together to make certain that bullies realize that they're really not in charge. Can I, just, can I, that? I, I just want to add one thing for anyone else who's concerned about bullying. You need to report it. You need to make sure that you're going to somebody and reporting it. There is a bullying incident form that every school has in their office that will be filled out. It needs to happen. You don't just have to take it. You have to report it so that these kinds of things can then be followed up on and then people can provide the resources. I will tell you, part of the concern with me and the reason why I put forward this bill is not just about protecting the victims, but it's also about addressing the perpetrator. There's something wrong when a person decides that they want to attack somebody else mm -hmm. and make fun of them mm -hmm. because they're also not feeling good about themselves. Mm -hmm. yep. And they need help too so that they can learn how to handle the issues that they're dealing with. And so from that perspective, it's dual responsibility. It's helping yourself, but it's also ensuring that you're also protecting future people from falling victim to this person as well and helping them to get help so they can become okay. a better person. Gracias por la pregunta. Okay. Next. Um, hello, I'm, my name is Rachel. I go to Thomas W. Pyle Middle School and um, so a lot of kids are throwing around words that are associated with the LGBTQIA plus community, um, like in a, with bad connotation, connotations associated with them. And kids are bullying other kids by saying that they are gay or that they are lesbian 
or that their parents are gay or lesbian. Um, and so uh, it's become a really big problem. And I'm, I'm only in sixth grade, but in the couple of months that I've been at Pyle, I've noticed this problem quite a lot. And um, so what are you guys doing to help protect the LGBTQIA plus community, especially in middle schools when kids aren't educated very much about this topic? So they don't know very much about why it's really bad to say things like this. All right, well, uh, Councilman Glass. Rachel, thank you for, for asking your question. Uh, you know, I have, I have the distinction of being the first LGBTQ member of the council. And so uh, I remember what it was like uh, being your age, whether it was middle school or high school. And, you know, I'm, I'm old enough that we didn't really talk about those things. And I didn't come out until after I was in college. Um, but people clearly threw those words at me when I was in middle school or in high school. And there's a constant theme that we're hearing tonight, and it's about bullying and whether it is bullying based on where you're from, what language you speak, your religion, the color of your skin, or your sexual orientation or gender identity, you need to tell your principal. You need to tell the school because it needs to be recorded and it needs to be stopped. And so that is on one level how we, we stop this because we have to tell people that it's okay to be gay it's okay to be whomever you are and however you identify. Mm -hmm. And I know that all of us here on the county council, and I know that I'm gonna say nearly every elected official in, this, in the county supports everyone's ability to be who they are because we are a loving place. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people need to be educated. Sometimes people need to be told they're wrong. And that's usually where the principal comes in or a parent comes in. But it's also why we have Pride Month here, which I helped organize during the month of June, making sure that everyone feels that they can celebrate, and whether you're LGBTQI plus or anything else, that there's a place for you in this loving, diverse community. And so if you have any other questions, please follow up with me on social media, or, and I, I open that invitation for anybody who might not even feel comfortable asking the question, but you can find me on social media. Let me just add that I also, when I was a member of the Board of Education, that's when we were taking on the curriculum um, where we were addressing a lot of these issues, and, and there was a lot of pushback. Uh, and, and I recall, you know, being the president of the board and, and, and raising my hand to support all these changes in curriculum. Um, but I also just want to commend you for that question, and I think that, I, I think I speak for all my colleagues, that we will be having, you know, some conversations with our board, and we will be definitely, through budget, be thinking a lot about everything that has been shared here, because I'll be honest with you, it is it, it's disheartening to me to hear all of these amazing, amazing young people, one after the other, come and talk about all these bullying and all of these issues happening in our school system, uh, when we are such an extraordinary, diverse community, and it, it's just, you know, it's sad that it's still occurring. And so we have got to put that at the top of the agenda. And whether it is all these issues around, you know, uh, mental health and how do we strengthen a lot of these resources or whether it's professional development uh, and also just, you know, curriculum for our students, we've got to do something because this is, this is definitely, again, something that, you know, it, 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 is, it, it wasn't that different the last uh, town hall that we had. So, so it's definitely you know, widespread. I do want to turn to Councilmember Reamer, who hasn't spoken for a little while. Go ahead. I just want to add, I, I, my colleagues have made great points. Um, you know, it's tough to hear that it, how common it is, mm -hmm. but the only thing that, that is truly going to move that needle is when we all stand up to it every time yeah. it happens. And as parents, we have to educate our kids on what's right and wrong, and we have to constantly educate them about that, you know, that ways of thinking that actually sort of support bullying, like, oh, look at that, that kid is a jock, or that kid is a nerd, like, you, you gotta educate young people from the very earliest age that that's not an appropriate way to think about people. But then as students, you have got to do the courageous thing every time it happens, and stand up for your friend or your classmate, 
And I think you all, we all know we're learning in the schools from a young age now how to deal with bullying. I see it in my kids in the elementary school. They're learning these techniques that we didn't have when I was a kid. When I was a kid, it was, you know, too bad. Um, now you actually have ways to think about it and how to respond. But every little act of courage that one of you shows standing up for another kid is just building and building and building. Mm -hmm. And it's going to change this over time. And, and so we can tr do our part, but you have to keep doing your part and do it better and more and stronger every day. Because every time you intervene, you're, 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 making, you're, you're reducing the amount of bullying in this world, and you're going to reduce the amount of bullying that, that we have tomorrow and, and, and the year after that. Okay. Next question. Uh, hello, my name is Franklin. Uh, um, I'm in 11th grade, and I'll go here to reading. Uh, and I've seen that most students don't know how to use credit cards, debit cards, or how to do taxes, or save money, or how to spend their money. Um, many students do, uh, doesn't know that. So being realistic, the classes we take really doesn't teach us none, none of that. So, but I mean, we learn stuff, but I mean, it doesn't help us on us, the students, on 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 <laughs> on things uh, you know in real life. Mm -hmm. I think we should get some kind of resource to learn these things because these days we can't compete with technology we have. We need some kind of help for us to survive out there. So my question is, what are some programs or classes we get in school to learn all of this kind of stuff? Yeah, uh, Councilor Fietzen. Well, a couple things. First of all, I think it's a, a really great point and I do think that every single student should have the tools to understand finances of how to live life because Today we live in a world where if you don't know these things, the earlier you know them, the better off you are because we have lots and lots of young people who start off their lives in debt already and serious financial issues and you carry your credit with you forever. It's like your fingerprint. And that can affect whether you can buy a house, it can affect whether you can purchase a car, whether you can get access to certain uh, jobs. Uh, people don't realize this, but the number one reason why people don't get federal jobs, federal clearance, is not because of any other reason than they don't have high enough credit. Their finances aren't in order, and that's seen as a, a huge uh, risk. We have some great programs. We need to do a lot better. There's a junior academy finance park here. Right next so, door. So, so, right so, so right. we, we, we uh, literally sharing this property with you in high school, so we need to do a better job of connecting, we talked about yeah. earlier, with other uh, areas on making sure that our young people all know what resources are available. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to do a much better job of that, working with the school system as elected leaders to make sure that not only we're providing resources, but we're connecting people to those resources, making you aware uh, of those resources. I also worked at the state level uh, to try to get uh, financial education as a requirement, as part of the curriculum in every school. There was some pushback on that of what that could potentially crowd out in terms of other things uh, in the curriculum. I continue to believe that everybody should have that. It should be part uh, of our curriculum, but we need to continue to make sure that not only are we providing you uh, with those tools that you need in order to live your everyday life, uh, but that we uh, uh, make sure that we're connecting you uh, to those tools to making sure that you know what's available. Thank you, and we'll, we'll look into figuring out how we can uh, provide more access to that particular financial literacy part that's just outstanding. It's a terrific program. Yeah. Yeah. Junior yes, yeah, junior achievement, yeah. All right, before our next question, I just want to do a time check for everyone. We've got a little bit under 10 minutes left. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Tatiana. Um, I'm a sophomore here at Wheaton High School, and my question is about activism. I know that every single student here is an activist for something that they care about, whether it be anything that you can imagine from climate change, to caring about local gun laws or uh, gun laws overall. And my question is, I know so many students that wanna speak out against what they believe in, speak for what they believe in, and yet as students we feel punished for that because we can't leave the school building or if we don't go to school to activate for what we believe in, advocate, then you know we don't get excused from assignments. We can't redo tests and it feels like we're punished for exercising our First Amendment rights. And I wanna know, 
what you as the council board members can do to help us students who care about these issues so much that we want to tell people how we feel and since you know so many of us aren't old enough to vote but if we have enough people to say this is wrong or this is right then you know we can say something and get something done with it but i feel as a student my voice is lost among adults who are telling me no you have to sit down you can't go and fight for what you believe in. Thank you for that question. I'm going to have Councilmember Jawanda and then Councilmember Rice. I agree. I agree with you, and I wanted to let that applause happen because I would. I'm doing it too. Um, I've created an organization a couple years ago called Our Voices Matter that primarily works with students to help create and in schools, in some schools, to try to give students the strategies to advocate for the things that they are most passionate about, whether it be stronger gun laws. I know many of us, I, I walked down the stu street with the Blair students a few years ago when they walked out and many other students uh, protesting uh, our horrible gun policies in this, uh, in this country uh, and uh, the election of the current president. Um, and so I think schools around the country, and Montgomery County is no different, are grappling with how to best support student adv adv advocacy and activism, and what are the policies that need to change. And I think that's one of the many ways Montgomery County, in a lot of ways, we're trying to figure out who we are and adapt to this, the population and the people here. And I think this emerging student activism, which is needed on climate change, which is needed on gun control, which has already had a tremendous impact, and, and is a way for you to learn. I think some of the best learning happens in doing these types of activities. So I am fully in support, and we will be working with our school board colleagues uh, to help them figure out and suggest and work with them on ways that you can craft a policy that can incorporate the passion and energy that is just we hear in your voice, how that can be incorporated into the curriculum in a meaningful way and not penalize you. And I'll be there to support you in advocating if I have to testify myself. So I think it's, I'm proud of you and keep doing it. Councilmember Rice. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a different spin on this. Activism is what you're doing tonight. You didn't have to leave school. You didn't have to miss anything to do it. Activism is like the young ladies you heard who came into Councilmember Glass's office and met with them, and many students who have been in my office as well. I can tell you that activism takes many forms, and so from that perspective, don't limit yourself in thinking that the only way you can activate is by a mass of people uh, holding up signs in the street. That is one way. It certainly is, and I support that. But there's so many other ways in which you can also be effective. I can tell you that your singular voice in a council member's office talking about something that you care about and believe in makes a difference. We've enacted many policies because people have come to us and told us, whether young people or old people, about what it is that matters to them and how it needs to change. That's what your government is supposed to do. That's what our responsibility is to listen to individuals who come to us because yes, we represent 1.1 million people in totality, but the reality is, is that as people come and give us problems that are happening in their community that they need us to tackle, our responsibility is to do that. And so what I'm saying to you is don't limit it and think that the only way that you can be an activist is by you know, holding up the sign in a parade because that's not just it. You can also be an activist by being an individual talking about issues that are important to you, writing about an issue for council member for a day. Those are the kinds of things that are also activism and also will get the job done. So Thank I encourage you. you to use all of those in your toolbox. And don't forget social media, a very powerful tool as well. There you go. Okay. We've only got five, five minutes, minutes left. So this will probably be our last question okay. of the night. Okay, hi, my name is Akhilio Solomon. I'm a junior at Wheaton High School. So at Wheaton High School, we're very blessed to have a lot of cultural diversity and uh, teachers who truly embrace all co our cultural differences. We have programs like MSP and International Club to make sure that each student truly fits in. But I have friends who go to other MCPS schools who don't have that. There are small groups of minorities who are underrepresented and a lot of my friends feel out of place. I, as, as a part-time job, I work at Argyle Country Club where I always ask to work an event called Ready, Aim, Teach, which is optional for teachers to attend where they learn how to become better educators, close 
educational gaps from cultural differences to disabilities. I feel like requiring teachers from all over Montgomery County to go to programs like this will really help problems like the ones I've, represent, I've presented and my peers have presented. What do you guys think? Well, I, first of all, thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's you know a best practice. Um, so we'll definitely take that into consideration. And as we said before, you know, we do have here also some of these handles. Please, if you don't get your question in, just you know, tweet at us, send us an email, et cetera. And especially those good, good news stories that can be best practices, we would, we'd love to hear from that as well because it's not just about things that are not working but also things that are working that we can scale up or replicate. Um, so send us more information about that. Um, you know, we're always interested in what's, what's working from, from your perspective. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's try to get as many in as possible because this time is almost running out. Next question. Um, hello, my name is Wilson Osman and I'm at Sligo Middle School, number six here. And um, my question for you is how can you change materials at Montgomery County Public Schools, um, especially headphones? It can cause stress for teachers, like when it gets tangled and the earbuds break and it can prevent students from watching educational videos. I didn't quite hear the, no, the question very well. Lillian, puedes repetir? About, um, well, about how can we change materials at Montgomery? Yeah. Okay. So what we're going to do is let everybody ask the question. We're going to write it down and quickly so okay. everybody can get their question in. Um, okay. Well, um, my question is that um, at one of my classes, there's some people that don't understand English, and there's no translator, and then. Yeah, I feel like they get left out because they don't understand the class. And what school are you in? Sligo Middle School. Sligo. Okay, well, taking notes. Thank you. We'll follow up on that. Next question. He, he was the waiting side. over there, yeah, so we're going to take him here. Hello. Um, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Josiah Altschler, and I'm a junior at Wheaton High School. Uh, the day after the Parkland shooting, on February 14, 2018, a student at Clarksburg High School brought a loaded pistol into school. He alleged that he just wanted to protect himself, but according to a report by Fox 5, the student had a cache of weapons inside his home, mm -hmm. including two rifles, a shotgun, a, ballist a ballistic vest, inert grenades, two, two handguns, and a replica electrical firing device and ammunition. They continue that prosecutors had the student. What's the question, please? The question. We do know, we, we know the background of that issue. What, what okay. is your question? Um, what is the Montgomery County, County Council doing about gun violence in our county? Also, can the Board of Education, whose solemn duty it is to ensure the safety of its students, release a statement or resolution voicing support for an expansion of federal or state gun laws? Okay, thank you for that question. We'll take that in. Next question. Yo solo venía a pedirles que si por favor no, mi nombre es Jorge. Solo quería pedirle si, si se podrían mejorar las, las canchas de fútbol, los balones y poder tener nuevos uniformes. ¿En dónde, en dónde Jorge? ¿En dónde, ¿Dónde específicamente? ¿En tu escuela o en tu comunidad? En la comunidad. Ok, so Jorge wants to know how we can improve soccer fields and make sure that the, the state of the soccer fields are optimal as well as provide equipment. Gracias Jorge, eso lo vamos a tomar en consideración. ¿Y estás hablando del área de Wheaton? ¿En tu comunidad en dónde? ¿Dónde vives? Aspen Hill. Aspen Hill, gracias. In the Aspen Hill area. Next. Um, no, yeah, we, we, want to, we want to make sure that we hear from those who have not asked a question before. So if you have not asked a question, please approach the microphone and then we'll, we'll take note. But if you already ha had a question, then Sorry, because we're running out of time. Oh, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Denis. Soy de esta escuela. Uh -huh. uh, solo quería preguntar qué podemos hacer para incrementar el número de psicólogos en la escuela, porque esta escuela es muy grande y solo tenemos un psicólogo y muchos de los de los estudiantes ni siquiera saben que existe. Tenemos el wellness center, pero aparte de las 27 escuelas del condado, solo hay tres wellness centers. ¿Qué podemos Gracias. hacer para incrementar eso? Gracias. So Denis wants to know what we can do to add more school psychologists and also. Yes, and also the, um, the wellness centers uh, that we only have three, 
Uh, I'm just gonna do a real quick shout out to the County Council because we were the ones who pushed and pushed the funding for the Wellness Center here right. and the ones elsewhere. We're gonna continue to push and push so we can have as many wellness centers as possible. Muchas gracias, Denise, por tu pregunta. Okay, number six. My name is Elena and I go to Tacoma Park Middle School and I was wondering what, I was wondering why you are using American Cancer Society findings to say cell towers are safe when you know it is a for-profit agency that is given mon money for, by the wireless companies. Have you thought about how much energy 5G will use? Thank you so much. I know we're gonna have a public hearing very soon about that issue, so stay tuned. Thank you. All right, this will be the last question. Last question. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Bree Cardine, and I'm an eighth grader at Ebrook Lee Middle School. Okay. My school is a majority um, minority school, um, and yes, it is evident that there's a lot of exposure to drugs and other activities that impact us um, and is increasing in a lot of high school and middle schools. My school, however, is particularly packed with ki um, kids who express or don't express their mental health problems, as a lot of people have trouble trusting their peers and adults. Um, and in question. fact, this week, it is Wellness Week, where homework is postponed in trade for a log where you can record what type of wellness activity you do, which is greatly appreciated by the students. So, um, tell me your question. The question okay. is, how could we enforce more awareness and comfort with mental health around our school, and how can we as a school, and you as a council, enforce and stress the importance of ha having a healthy learning environment? Okay. Thank you so much for that. We will take that into consideration. All right. All right, that thank you. Uh, council President Navarro, if you have any last words you'd like to share. Well, I just really want to thank everybody for coming over, uh, coming out tonight, expressing your views. It is so true that activism takes a lot of different forms, so please stay in touch. We are listening. We want to respond to you. Stay engaged. Be safe. And, uh, and again, I want to thank my colleagues for being here this evening. Uh, buenas noches. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Thank you to our council members for hosting this Youth Town Forum. Thank you to the students, and thank you, everyone, who made it possible. Again, if your question didn't get answered tonight, make sure you reach out via social media using the hashtags MoCoYouth and MyVoiceMatters. I'm Crystal Park. Have a great evening. All right.